The agenda is set. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. It's time to talk. Red alert in Ukraine. Russian troops on the ground and the West weighs its options. Turkey's prime minister and a corruption scandal. Who's telling the truth? Who owns the truth? And Uganda's anti-gay law. Can pocketbook pressure from outside change the inside? Well, welcome to the show, everyone. I've invited three people today to talk, ponder, and pry apart these headlines. The World Bank has frozen aid to Uganda in protest of a new anti-law, anti-gay law, I should say. The big question, will money talk? Well, Andrea Bender has an answer for us. She is a development aid analyst, and she has worked in Uganda. Andrea, it's good to have you on the show with us today. Thanks. Turks are watching a corruption scandal that could bring down the government of Prime Minister Erdogan. More on that in just a moment from Dilek Kurban. Dilek is one of Germany's leading Turkey analysts. Dilek, it's good to have you back on the show with Thank us you. today. And my next guest has been at the table and has seen firsthand talks between the European Union and her country, Ukraine. She is an activist committed to cleaning up politics in Kiev, and she's with me today. I'm happy to welcome to the show Svetlana Salishchuk. Svetlana, good to have you on the show today. Obviously, the entire world asking, is your country about to be at war with Russia? It's a big question to us as well. But uh, it's very important to call things with its names. And uh, I think it is not just a war with, with Russia, but it's a clear insanity of one man, Putin, who decided to invade our independent country. And are you expecting the West to come in and protect you? That is also the question at this hour. I think the West cannot leave us alone, because let me just remind you that Putin violated not just Ukrainian legislation, but also what he does, it's in bridge with international law. And uh, Ukraine uh, surrounded its nuclear weapon in 1994, in accordance to the agreement, Budapest Memorandum, where US, UK and Russia has to guarantee its security. Okay, that Budapest Memorandum. I want to pick, on, uh, pick up on that in just a moment. But let, let's talk about what's going on right now. You know, from Brussels to Washington, options are being weighed on how to prevent the crisis in Crimea from becoming a war in Ukraine. Moscow says that it is protecting ethnic Russians in Crimea from ultra-nationalist Ukrainians at the request of ousted President Viktor Yanukovych. Now, Ukraine says this is a declaration of war by Russia. Well, Europe and the U.S. are scrambling to find options to limit what has become the biggest geopolitical crisis of the 21st century. Just two weeks ago, after months of protests, mainly in the capital Kiev, President Viktor Yanukovych was ousted and left the country. He's now been replaced by an interim government. Since then, events have unfolded rapidly. Opinion in the country is divided along pro-Western and pro-Russian lines. There is talk of Ukraine breaking up. The crisis has become a military standoff over Ukraine's Crimea region, where Russia's forces, who have bases there, have taken up positions. The international community is watching the tense situation with alarm. So, Dana, there is a petition circulating right now calling for the UK and the US to come in and defend Ukraine. And it's based on this Budapest memorandum that you're talking about. Are Ukrainians expecting, I want to ask you this again, this is a big question, are you expecting the US military to defend Ukraine's borders? I think Ukrainians' ex main expectations is to how not how to not allow this war happen and i think we have to uh, together to find a solution of how to ensure that because but what, what is the solution i mean you can't win a military conflict with russia you're, you're absolutely right absolutely and that's why we are talking about international community role and it's about all possible uh, uh, measures because at the moment we understand that it's not going to be a war be between ukraine and russia it's going to be war just in the center of europe if you want third world war so we have to use all means in order to prevent that um what about getting the russians to pull back some and allowing a referendum in Crimea 
that would allow the people there to decide whether or not to stay with Ukraine or go to Russia. Is that something that the Ukrainian government would accept? I wouldn't accept this agenda to be discussed. And why? Because until last Friday, it was the whole three months of our so-called European Revolution, there was a fight between Ukrainian society against its corrupt and authoritarian regime led by Yanukovych, President Yanukovych. And when he escaped, when he ran away, and we found and disclosed all those documents that prove his corruption vertical and also that he was responsible for giving orders to kill people. Uh, last Friday, Russia invaded our sovereign territory, independent country, with their troops. Nothing happened between Russian uh, and, uh, let's say, Russian and Ukrainian speaking language uh, citizens, or between Ukraine well, and Russia. Let, let, it's let, not a up, question. let me pick up on that. Um, the, the Russians have said at the um, UN Security Council that um, they were asked by Mr. Yanukovych to come in and protect ethnic Russians in Ukraine. Um, and he said that ethnic Russians in Ukraine are being targeted now by the new government in Kiev. Is that true? This is nonsense. And it's proved not only by independent international community and uh, by media, but also let me remind you that Yanukovych now is not in the status of the former even Ukrainian president, but he is in the status of the uh, person who was once again giving orders to kill people. He's a wanted man. We understand that there's an exactly. arrest warrant and out for him. And right? it was proved not only by interim new government, but also by his former colleagues, by the party. But, is it, but let me ask you this, Fitlana. Is it true that in the new government now, has there been talk about any type of legislation discriminating against ethnic Russians or banning the use of the Russian language? Of course not. That's nonsense once again. So that's not true? Absolutely. And let me tell you that I'm Ukrainian, but I speak Russian. My grandfather mother is from Russia. My mother is a teacher of Russian language and half of Kiev speaking uh, Russian language and even in Western Ukraine there are a lot of people who speak in uh, Russian language. What? It's like, let me make this comparison, there are millions of people who are speaking English in Germany or there are three and a half million of Russians who are living in Germany but it's not, uh, we ha don't have a discussion whether they have to have their own territory. Right, you know? okay. There, there's been a lot um, in the last 48, 72 hours um, said about extremists, anti-Semites, fascists from Western Ukraine now being in the new government. Is there anything to that? Ukraine brought this on to themselves, putting in fascist, anti-Semitic and anti-Russian politicians in power. That's not true. Absolutely. Where is and that coming from, though? From Russian brainwashing machine, which is working very efficiently, not only in Russia, but also in Ukraine and also all over the world. And we have to be very careful, especially media and journalists, with bringing these statements uh, uh, to the discussion. So you think it's part of a propaganda machine? Absolutely. It's a, it's a pretext. Because, absolutely. Because what we see, even from the first appointments that new government does in those eastern and southern parties, regions of Ukraine, which are... Uh, uh, naturally most pro, uh, more pro-Russian. These appointments, they appoint people who are speaking Russian, who are even Jews, and they are new governments of the, uh, of the, uh, in, in those regions. We just prove that this is not true. Let me open this up a little bit and, and ask, uh, Dile, you hear what is happening right now in Russia and in Ukraine. Um, who's going to defend the Ukrainians? It well, sounds like she's calling for the EU mm -hmm. and the U.S. to defend them. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that what will have to happen? I mean, it's certainly a serious um, challenge to the, the, the war, I mean, the international order that was established after the Second World War. Um, it's a complicated problem um, because, first of all, there is now precedent of um, international intervention. Um, which happened in Kosovo, for example, where that international status quo was changed, right? Um, where there was a, a sort of demand from um, within. So we can't just say that, you know, all borders set after Second World War should stay as it is because that's international law. On the other hand, um, at least in Crimea, um, it looks like, well, well you, have, you, have a, you don't have a homogenous society, so you have different groups. I think what's really important is to be able to understand um, what the people in Crimea, but also people in general in Ukraine, want uh, for their future. Um, if there's a demand so from a, within so for help. So in other help, words, have a referendum. I think in Crimea, it looks like a good 
um, option, it seems, um, also to maybe delegitimize this, um, you know, the Russian propaganda. But of course, you don't also want to set an example where well, you have yeah, referendum I mean, based, after referendum. And you're giving yeah. Russia there what it wants too, Andre. Is, is that what is going to happen here? We have to give Russia at least something in order to get a pullback? Well, if you negotiate, you always have to give something, right? Um, and uh, we're in a position where we need to negotiate uh, with Russia. And if I understand you correctly, your call was not necessarily like as uh, the first means that we defend militarily Ukraine. I mean, of course, that would be part of the package if necessary, but there are many steps uh, before that, uh, that need to be taken. And I think one important point in trying to figure out what would be a strategy to negotiate uh, with Russia is also um, to um, take the discourse apart. I mean, Putin is excellent uh, in his discourse. Why is he at the United Nations or um, uh, mm -hmm. representatives of Russia saying we need to protect civilians, um, uh, where Russian the... civilians? Where's the discourse coming from? Because the West invaded countries in you know, under the, the label of responsibility to protect, to protect civilians. Now we as an audience, uh, as, a, as a Western actor now have to explain the different audiences in the world, what is the difference between a military intervention in Libya to protect civilians and of Russia to protect Russian civilians. I'm not saying this, I'm just saying this is a discourse that is very, it's very intelligently made. It's something completely different, but it rings a bell with many people in the world. So it's a very strategically good way of Putin to frame the conflict. Pick it up, Sivan. Yeah, I just wanted to say that there's no one to protect civilians from. I know. But Ukrainian authorities didn't threat any civilians in the country. And let me just uh, tell you that all those Eastern and even pro-Russian, so-called pro-Russian regions now, they're against the war with Russia. And they say, Russia goes away. We will deal with our problems with ourselves. Language problem is our problem. It's not, we do not threat civilians. And also, you know, it's an interesting narrative. We say, we need to give something Putin in order to negotiate with them, with him. Why do we have to negotiate with who, Putin? Why in hell some other country invades with military troops, uh, a sovereign country, and demand something uh, into response. It's like a you know narrative between a raper and victim. We say, okay, let's neg negotiate. What sh should we give to, to a raper? That is a valid point. But my point to you is, you do not have the the military leverage in this game. Russia, if it wants, can stay in Crimea and can also move into eastern Ukraine. You cannot stop Russia from doing that yeah, alone. Right. So you have to get Putin to come to the table and talk. The question is, you, as speak, coming from Kiev, are you willing to give Russia something to get a pullback? I don't think that at the moment there are other means, I think. And first of all, it's economic sanctions from European Union and US. Let me ask and you, then Russia will uh, feel, well, Putin will feel that the economy will go just uh, do you, but out of control. How, real, how realistic are economic sanctions? Um, You've had a lot of um, people in Washington saying economic sanctions will only work if the Germans are on board because the Germans have the, the biggest share with the Russians. Um, and we've heard nothing from Berlin about doing anything to business ties or sanctions. I mean, that's just a no-go area for Merkel, isn't it, Andrea? Well, it's a very difficult uh, question because it depends probably a lot on how the situation uh, will uh, develop over the next couple of days and, and weeks. But uh, obviously, uh, Merkel um, always had an approach, uh, a relatively close approach to Russia. We are dependent in, uh, in terms of uh, energy supplies uh, on Russia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, of course, a lot of, uh, of trade, uh, the UK um, as a financial center. Um, has of course a lot of uh, Russian uh, investment and there's in, no, there's in the nothing city coming of London, from London and so on. About that either, so there's true. nothing coming from London on freezing like assets in in London and so on. So I agree that there would be a lever, but it's also a lever that would be very costly um, to uh, crisis-ridden UK, um, to uh, Europe, uh, Germany's uh, uh, economy that's still felt by by Germans to be fragile. So that's why it's so important that it's uh, that the discourse is framed in the in the right way, and Maybe. that's why I think the um, fascist anti-Semitic argument, for example, the Western uh, public is un unsure who's who, who's the opposition uh, in the Ukraine, whom are we uh, supporting? We don't understand the conflict, which is all something um, that calls for restraint among the civil societies in in, in Europe. Yeah, and Merkel has also been quoted as saying that she spoke with Putin, and she was quoted as saying that he is quote you know in another world. 
And, and when you see that, it makes you wonder, okay, you know, who are you talking to here? Can, can you negotiate? Um, Svetlana, what about Kiev and the new government? Can you give assurances that this new government will be a unity government? That this government will do everything it can to ensure that all Ukrainians are represented by this government? Is that something that this new government, a new parliament, will be able to ensure? I can't assure you because I'm not a prime minister, but what we've heard, what we see from their first steps and their first statements, they say that they will to do so. And let me remind you that the whole European revolution in Ukraine started when Yanukovych, after four years of his discourse or his promises to his own voters that we're going to sign a cessation agreement just one week prior to the Vilnius summit, refused. He gave up and he said, we're not go uh, there anymore. And now the new government say, OK, we will finish what Yanukovych started and we will do what he promised even to Yanukovych voters that we will finish this association agreement. And this association agreement can be a framework to, you, to country to be united because, first of all, it's about very painful economic reforms that has to be implemented in order to when survive. When this crisis is over, though, do you think the drive for Ukraine to be closer to Europe, is that drive going to be stronger? I think so, to be honest, because the, uh, we, you know, from the very independence 23, four years ago, 1991, Ukraine didn't have that uh, national idea, if you want, or this strategic course, or wh what are we and where we go. And now we had this idea, we want to be more civilized country, more de democratic country. This is a, if you want, a light okay. for us. And before we move on, let me just ask you this. Um, let's say um, Putin agrees to pull back on one condition, and that is that Ukraine agrees to never become a member of NATO. Is that something that the Ukrainians would say yes to? It's up to Ukrainians to decide. It's not up to Putin or anyone else but if that in was, this but world. If that was a, pre a precondition, do you think that the government in, in Kiev would say, OK, we will agree to that, to I stay out of NATO? I will repeat once again, it's not up to Russia or up to Putin to give us any conditions. Like, okay. uh, yeah. All right. Very good. All right. Well, we're going to move on. Um, obviously, very passionate um, arguments on both sides here, and I'm sure we'll be talking about this um, for some time to come. We want you to keep the conversation going with us on Twitter and Facebook. Let us know what you think about what's happening right now in Ukraine. You know, it's the hashtag DW Agenda. That's where you can reach us. All right. It is a claim that we have heard from Turkey's Prime Minister Erdogan before. He says that forces outside his country are plotting to bring down his government and ignore the will of the people. Now, you may remember the clashes between protesters and police in Istanbul last summer. Well, now a corruption scandal involving the prime minister and his son has the government once again in crisis mode. Last weekend, rallies were held across Turkey by supporters and opponents of Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan. They were triggered in part by a leaked audio recording of a phone call allegedly between Erdogan and his son Bilal. In it, the two appear to be talking about hiding millions of euros in cash. The disclosures come against the backdrop of a huge corruption probe that began last December, involving key people in Erdogan's AK party. The government replaced prosecutors leading the investigation, sparking accusations of a cover-up. Erdogan says the probe was orchestrated by his former ally, the influential cleric Fethullah Gülen. The U.S.-based preacher has millions of followers. Turkey is heading for municipal elections later this month. Is Erdogan's grip on power irreparably damaged? And that's why we've got you here today to talk about this grip on power. Elections just around the corner. Can we be sure that they are going to be fair and free? That's the first question. Well, that actually is now a question that is being asked in Turkey for the first time after a long while. Um, we've had free and fair elections for a long time. It was never really a discussion. Um, but now questions are being raised. But there are citizen initiatives also to make sure so. I think overall um, they will be free and fair. Um, there's also international community um, you know, supervising. The outcome of the elections, um, we are not expecting um, a surprise there yet. I mean, Erdogan will um, 
have uh, will still um, keep his um, the, the votes that he has had in the last municipal elections. It looks like, yeah. but the question, of course, is what the target is for him, because in the last municipal elections, his party got 38 mm -hmm. percent, right. um, which for him now is not enough. It's I mean, not if enough. He's, well, because he's, he's he wants to be the next president, and he's preparing himself for the upcoming presidential he, elections. Th but the concern is, is is that he is losing his grip on power right now. I mean, this is a scandal. We've had you on the show before talking mm -hmm. about uh, crises um, in the government. But you say this one is different because this is something that could mean the end of Erdogan's power. Slowly so, yeah. I mean, this is certainly the biggest um, crisis, the biggest threat to Erdogan's um, power for a couple of reasons. One is, for the first time, we're talking about serious corruption allegations against a government which came to power on the promise of ending corruption. That was one big reason why the voters voted for and, AKP. And the corruption, of course, it's almost salacious in the way things are coming out because people are coming home watching the news in the, in the evening mm -hmm. in Turkey and they're actually hearing taped phone conversations. Not on, the, not on, uh, not, not on TV, not on TV, um, because media is under huge pressure and they don't, the media doesn't broadcast that, okay, but on YouTube. Every night we are on YouTube and, and it's circulating. You know, you have internet. The, the government cannot control it even after they pass this new uh, they made uh, revisions in the internet law to prevent it. Um, but yeah, every night we are hearing new tapes. Yeah, thanks to the internet. Yeah. Yeah, may I ask you about that? Because it's interesting. I want to make a parallel. Do you think that this scandal may become a start of a new uprising in Turkey? Because in Ukraine, this whole Euro uh, European revolution started with the uh, unbelievable that the government just said, okay, we're not going to go, we're not going to sign the cessation agreement, and no one, no one believed that it can lead to such massive uprising of people. Mm -hmm. And first day there was just 2,000 of people standing in the center of Kiev, but in one week it was already yeah, uh, mm -hmm. million people. The big problem, mm -hmm. Svetlana, is that we asked that question too. Turkey's economy is not doing bad, as in Ukraine. Um, I think that's one big difference. This government has uh, quite a good record um, uh, of the past 12 years and or so. And you have a, a sizable middle class now that has yeah. a lot to lose if there is instability, right? Exactly. I mean, you know, the Turkish economy has been doing well. There's been political stability in the government, in the country for the first time for a long time, etc. And also, you know, we have had um, what would be comparable maybe to the demonstrations in Ukraine. We've had that last um, summer in the Gezi and they did it lead anywhere in that sense. But this time, it's not because we're now talking about corruption allegations, which are very serious. It's also now uh, the threat or the, yeah, the threat is coming not from a weak civil society movement, but from a former ally. An ally of Erdogan. Of Erdogan, the Gulenists, uh, who are extremely powerful. They control much of the police and the judiciary, and they're the ones that have, that have wiretapped. So the quest, one big question is, you know, you were talking about truth before. Mm -hmm. Who has, yeah, who, you know, the who's truth? Who's telling the truth? Who owns the truth well, in who Turkey? who owns the truth, at least who owns the information, right. is the Gulenists more than the government. And that's the biggest um, problem now for Erdogan government because in, you know, the, the elections are at the end of the month, more will likely come, we will hear more. Now, it, government will, the AKP will still do fine, you know, also maybe in the general elections next year, but what has irreversibly changed for Erdogan is, is that he no longer is this clean, um, sort of his government will always be perceived because nationally and internationally as control, a corrupt government. He's not controlling the message anymore, and that's because he exactly. can't control the internet. And you know, we were talking with Svetlana here about the propaganda wars that's going on right now, and, and it, there's something similar in, in Turkey as well. There's legislation trying to regulate the internet, but you can't control the content on the internet. Yes, but they're also, certainly, and in Turkey, according to statistics, 40%, 47% of households have internet, that's huge. But then the question is, who is looking at these um, internet sites? Because the government controls the media a lot, and the pro-government media has been incredibly um, pro-government um, in this whole affair, and part of the population, a large part of the population, is getting its information exclusively from state media. From not state media, but pro-government media, okay. media control, private media mm -hmm. controlled by Erdogan, who have actually even went so far as to fabricate um, documents to prove uh, to support the government's position on these wiretaps, for example. You know, they fabricated fabricated the reports by a so-called an intelligence. Um, company from the US, which then were denied. But the problem is they don't then publish, of course, this denial. So people, the, the biggest problem is that a good amount of people in Turkey, maybe half, 
you know, the, the base of Erdogan yeah. believe in him still. No, 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 yeah, May I ask a question? Because there's one thing that uh, it's very difficult for outsiders to understand is that you read in every news uh, report that the Gulenists are controlling a large part of the police and <laughs> um, of the judiciary. At the same time, it's always labeled as a civil society movement. It's not a formal party. It doesn't have like a formal structure as an organization. So what are the means to control the judiciary and the police in, in, in such a way? Well, they have their people. Um, I mean, Gulenists predate Erdogan. They have been around since 1980 or so. And Erdogan can't purge the government and all the branches. He can't purge them of the Gulenists No, that's overnight. what he's trying to do. Right. But the problem is, is that he allied. It, it was in his benefit when he came to power that Gulenists were in the state structure, in the police, in the judiciary, especially in the judiciary and the police intelligence. Because at the time, if you remember, Erdogan was fighting against the military, which was, you know, trying to really overthrow the government. So if we look at Ergenokon case, for example, which was opened in 2007 or so against the military, high-ranking military members, who did that? The Gulenists in the police intelligence and judiciary. So it worked fine, this, you know, cooperation until now. That's why now what the government is doing in amending the internet law, in amending the law on um, high council of judges and prosecutors and planning to amend the law on intelligence is they are trying to increase their grip on the executive. That's what's happening in now Turkey. The executive is increasing its powers vis-a-vis -vis the parliament, vis-a-vis -vis the judiciary, vis-a-vis -vis everyone basically, so that because the problem, for example, internet law, obviously one problem is that we will have less freedom, but the other is the, uh, the, the, the extraordinary power given to national intelligence agency to ask service providers to keep data, to keep the data, yeah, not internet traffic. I mean, well, that's a, that, you know, that's a discussion we're having here in Europe as sure. well, that, um, in the United States. Um, what, what though, does all of this mean for Turkey's image abroad, international relations for Ankara? Um, when, when you have a scandal like this that, that has not played out yet? Well, it doesn't, of course, reflect well on relations with um, the U.S. and the EU. In the recent, department released by, recent uh, report released by the U.S. State Department on uh, religious freedoms in Turkey, the um, corruption allegations were named as scandal by the Obama administration, which is, of course, in terms of diplomatic language, quite a strong word, right. warning. The um, European Parliament will release a very harsh report next week expected. Um, the, you know, the head of the European Parliament, you know, I mean, the EU is not happy about it, that's clear. But the problem is, um, you know, local politics matters more, as and, everywhere. And you say Erdogan still has his base, he still has his support. And, it, it, you know, before we move on, let me ask you, is he the, the type of leader, the type of politician who will trample all types of rights in order to maintain his power? Not all types of, but significantly, yeah. And, and we see more, of, more and more of that. And you, you would say there's more to come, too, because he's not finished um, yeah, shoring I mean, there up is, his, his yeah, defenses. Yeah, there's more. There's, there'll be more information coming. You know, there'll be more allegations, more wiretaps, and that's going to make him even more defensive and aggressive. Um, and one big problem in Turkey is, of course, we don't have a viable opposition alternative to Erdogan. It's precisely because there's not a good alternative that some people will end up voting for Well, what for about him. all these people who were protesting last summer? What happened to them? Well, they don't. I mean, they are still around. They're still protesting, but, you know, they don't have... A lot what? of those people have never voted before. They were young people huh, who've never voted before. Well, why aren't and they... also said they won't vote for any political party in Turkey at the moment. Yeah, but why aren't they using social media then to organize? I mean, why aren't they doing what, you know, the, the Ukrainians have done, for example, in, in trying to, to um, put together groups that can filter the government as you do in Kiev. Why, not, why aren't we seeing that happen now? The state in Turkey is very strong, has always been. I don't know. I mean, of course, I don't know um, history of Ukraine that well, but, you know, the police, and there was a violent crack. You know, seven, eight people were killed. Yeah. I mean, we talked about that, you know, um, um, last year. But it's a high cost to be paid. And also, what's with the opposition within the AKP? I mean, isn't there some, someone in the AKP saying, well, if we want to ensure uh, the AKP being in power and being in power in the way we want it to be and not the Gulenists want it to be, then we have to replace Erdogan. And mm -hmm. there must yeah, be some what politicians about that? within really the really briefly, let me just say, is there, is there a replacement for Erdogan in sight? Yes or no? Not yet. Okay. All right. Let's move on then. We want you to keep the conversation going with us on Twitter and Facebook. Tell us what you think is going to happen to Erdogan. That's hashtag DW Agenda. All right. It is one of the harshest anti-gay laws in the world. Uganda's president has signed legislation that criminalizes 
homosexuality. The punishment, life in prison. Western countries have condemned the law and the World Bank has frozen indefinitely 65 million euros in loans, saying state-sanctioned discrimination is a blockade to the success of aid programs. Money may talk, but Uganda says it doesn't have to listen. Just a week ago, Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni signed an anti-gay law that imposes harsh penalties on homosexuals. Under the new legislation, gays can be jailed for life and punishments imposed on anyone who doesn't report them. The bill prompted angry responses from gay rights activists, the UN, the US, several EU governments and, unusually, the World Bank. Days after Museveni signed the law, the organisation delayed a 65 million euro loan for Uganda's health system. The financial loan giving institution is supposed to help countries fight poverty and rarely gets directly involved in politics. Its president, Jim Yong Kim, says the World Bank will have a broad discussion about discrimination in the upcoming months. Andrea, let me ask, based on your experience in Uganda, um, is the president right by saying he doesn't need the money, Uganda doesn't need the money? Well, certainly there are many other sources than the, the World Bank for uh, Museveni to tap into. Um, bec uh, because aid has only become one part of, uh, of Uganda's income, and uh, that's mainly uh, Chinese foreign direct investment, for example. It's, not, it's also Chinese direct investment. Just to compare, it's, uh, it's been in 2010 um, approximately 250 million US dollar in an investment compared to 90 uh, million US dollar now held back by the, by the World Bank as a loan. So you can already see what's the more attractive source. Then you also have around 200 million direct investment from Kenya. So if we would put together all the different countries who are now investing uh, in, in Uganda, the, 900, uh, the 90 million US dollar pale, so the so, leverage. So Uganda, so, so looking at the numbers game, then Uganda does not need the money from the World Bank. It will be just fine without the money. Money. Well, it depends on how you define it will be just fine. It depends on whether you talk about the government um, still having resources at their hands to implement projects that they, they, that they want to do. But at the same time, the international community, Uganda has been for a long time an aid darling. So there are a lot of projects that are run by the US government, by the UK, obviously, um, and many other aid agencies. So a lot of public goods are actually um, financed by the international community. So the Ugandan population will suffer directly um, from these loans being kept back and so on. Where do you think the impetus then for this decision by the World Bank, where is that coming from? Um, the World Bank is not known for making decisions based on legislation that has been passed in, in national parliaments. But, uh, but this is different. Why, why do you think this is coming from the World Bank? Um, I find this a very difficult question uh, to, to be frank um, because um, it seems a little bit random uh, to me that it's Uganda, it's this law, it's not been Nigeria that passed like an equally appalling uh, anti-gay law before. Um, in Uganda, um, uh, opposition parliamentarians have been under threat by the Museveni government for years. So, I mean, there are many, many things going on in the country uh, where you could make the argument that, well, you know, we should not continue to finance this government it has not been made. Um, so I do think uh, there might be two, uh, two reasons for this. The one is um, uh, Kim's uh, agenda or the World Bank's agenda to, to have, uh, not to have poverty, to eradicate absolute uh, poverty and realizing that ec economic development alone um, is not the lever to eradicate poverty because you see that uh, a lot of middle income countries who uh, do much better now economically still have uh, very poor people like India being, uh, and it, being but, the but case. But this, this, this would seem to make sense. I ask all of you, doesn't, doesn't it just make it's common sense to think that, that aid is going to work in countries where there is a, a there is good governance. Well, um, absolutely, I think, uh, and from what I know, this is how World Bank works. It's always not only about economy, but about democracy, about human rights. Because the more country, uh, the more free country is, the better economy uh, there is. And for example, in our case, uh, four years ago. Uh, 
uh, World Bank, when ha they had mission to Ukraine, they always met civil society and they were asking, okay, there is a, a very alarming legislation about uh, civil society organization is... Uh, so uh, whether they, they take it into account, whether they should give a, a government, authoritarian government or a government who is going to impose sanctions against that or another groups of, of society, whether they have to, to finance that actually. Because once again, the more free country is, the better economy But, but why this one, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out why this one case with Uganda. I mean, there are, um, I mean, if you look at the numbers, there are 81 other countries that have passed laws that make homosexuality illegal. Um, so there are 81 countries that could be, you know, punished by the World Bank if it wanted to. But we haven't seen that right now. But you also have cases, um, you know, you have cases here in Europe, you have cases in the United States where legislation is trying to be enacted that would discriminate against gays or, or other minorities. So. What's well, going on here? I mean, on one hand, I guess you can say, you know, this in particular law is uh, is quite severe, not because not only because of the penalty, you know, just life imprisonment right. for gays, but also it also brings upon a duty to everyone to inform um, to the to you know for espionage basically to to tell the state about any gay person that they know. Uh, in that sense, it goes really far. But having said that, I I think your question is valid. Um, when you look at the U.S., you know, there's still many states in the U.S. Who, which have um, you know, anti-gay um, laws, you know, sodomy was pro prohibited, was actually penalized until but, recently. But I think, you, I think you've answered your own question. I think it is the, the enforcement and how draconian these laws are. I think that's what has gotten the World Bank's attention. I mean, the law in Uganda, according to what Kim has said himself, he, he published an editorial explaining what's going on at the World Bank. This is a law that puts people in jail for life, but it also opens up all types of possibilities for people to be framed, for traps to be set, for vendettas um, to be you know, satisfied, um, all types of ugly situations to make the disadvantaged even more disadvantaged. And so he's saying that the World Bank cannot finance what's going on. Well, but I think the answer was in your own statement to, to the question. You said that it's the most draconian law in the world. So uh, I think international community has to react. And if money is painful for this government, that has to be reaction with the money. Because yeah, otherwise, who will react? Who will uh, care about those people? You know, well, you know that there have been be countries that have reacted. Norway, Denmark, you know, they, they've, st they've stopped their aid. But, uh, doesn't a country have more weight than the World Bank in issues like this? I mean, there are like two, two things that I uh, think uh, we should consider. I mean, the first is that I agree with you, the international community has to react. The question is whether the World Bank is the right actor within the international community to do that for two reasons. First of all, we already talked about the lever. Does it has, uh, have the lever? And second, what's the price for it? Because I do think the contestation over norms on how liberal, how open societies um, uh, will be is one of the big questions um, that arise with the power shift uh, in, in the world, right? So um, when it comes to human rights, uh, generally, we have a very different discourse um, uh, in the UN than we had it uh, uh, 10 years, 15, 15 years ago, and so on. Um, so we do, we, we do need, as the international community, to prepare for these norm contestations. But if we want to keep this also peaceful, then we need to have fora where we can still come together. So and you're saying the World Bank can be one of those forums. Uh, but th this, this norm contest that you're talking about, um, you know, Kim has said in his editorial that human rights, that means being protected from discrimination based on religion, sex, and sexual orientation. He has put it there black on white, that that's what human rights means to the World Bank. I mean, that line has been drawn. Well, what, means, what uh, human rights means to the leadership of the World Bank, and that's uh, also something to consider if the World Bank positions itself more politically, um, how to get 188 members on board. So I'm, I'm, I'm totally agree that the international community should act, but for me, it belongs much more into the political debate um, and not into uh, the World Bank's debate for the reason um, that we give up a space where we can still negotiate over this, uh, this uh, norm contestation, which is absolutely 
important and the countries who um, support uh, human rights and so on should draw their red lines and saying this is something that we don't do. That's why I think it's good from bilateral donors to say we freeze the money. But with the World Bank, I find it a shaky ground. Okay. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I want to say that, you know, on the other hand, I, I wanted to come back to Ukraine situation and compare it. Uh, to, to me, it also we can put it into the framework where we can discuss uh, not whether the, whether the World Bank reaction was appropriate, but where is the reaction of other international actors even more appropriate? Because it's like with Ukraine. When Ukrainian opposition and journalists and uh, civil society actors was asking Europe and US, please freeze assets of Yanukovych and his family and his close circle that put these accounts, save these accounts in your European countries and they travel to your seashores during the summer and they have palaces and residences in your countries and that's how they allow themselves to, to deal with us because they, uh, and uh, you know, what European Union d did, they take those sanctions only after we had deaths. When so people budget, but we're, so uh, we're my, still my question, my, my, sorry, my briefly. message was very briefly, uh, sanctions has to be preventive but not punish one Yeah, because the death. sanctions seem to always be reactive because everyone, you hear this at the Security Council, is we don't want to meddle in the affairs of a sovereign state. And we're seeing those lines blur now, aren't we? Russia and Ukraine, the latest example. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and I'm just wondering, is there going to be a, a, a new order that's going to be imposed from somewhere that's going to reestablish the sanctity of, of borders? I'm going to give you the last word. What do you think? You're, you're nodding your head. Well, I mean, it's a very, it's a long discussion, much belated. Um, there needs to be reform in the international community for sure. Um, the fact that, for example, Security Council is the only agency which is, you know, which has the power to and enforce law. Russia is on there. So Russia is on there. Right. China is on there. And we, we saw what happened in Syria. There really needs to be a very, and now in Ukraine, etc. Very. Uh, Russia also has anti, you know, sort of anti-gay laws. Right. There really needs to be a new, genuine discussion on who will rule, the, who rules the world. Yeah, the, who will rule the world? That is definitely going to be a discussion on many agendas for now. Ladies, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. And keep the conversation going on Twitter and Facebook. Tell me what you think about the show today. You can find me on Facebook. You can also tweet me at Brent Goff TV, or you can use the hashtag DW Agenda. And if you want to watch the show again, go to our website or you can watch us on YouTube. I'm Brent Goff in Berlin. Join me next time when I set the agenda.